Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is titled Shear Exhilaration, Wood Shear Wall and Diaphragm Design for the 2021 IBC. My name is Karen Beebe. I'm the Western Region Manager for APA's Field Services Division, and I'll serve as the moderator for today's session. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood products and systems where they are used. We also educate users and specifiers on the product's intended use and potential applications. Before we start the webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Handouts of the slides can be found in the control panel on your screen. We're going to bookend our discussion with our cameras on, but we will turn them off during the balance of the session so that we can maximize the size of the slides on your screen. And then we'll also have a Q&A session at the end of the program as time permits. Our class today is approved for both AIA and ICC continuing education credits, and a certificate will be provided for all attendees to use for AIA, ICC, or other organizations that self-report continuing education. And your feedback is important to us. Please note that you see a QR code on your screen. If you open the camera app on your smartphone and point it at your screen, that will take you to a link to the survey for today's session. It takes only a few moments, but it's very important to us. Our presenter today is Alita Dean, an engineered wood specialist for the Field Services Division of APA, a licensed professional engineer in the state of California. Alita graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a Bachelor's of Science in Architectural Engineering. Prior to joining APA, Alita worked as a structural engineer for nine years in the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles. Alita is an active member of the Structural Engineers Association of California and ICC in LA. Welcome to APA's webinar on the topic of shear walls for wood frame structures. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Alita Dean. Thanks, Karen. Um, as Karen mentioned, today's topic is shear exhilaration. So the overall strength of a building is really a function of its components. That's the roof, walls, floor, and foundation. They're all working together as a unit. So in today's session, we're gonna look at a top to bottom overview of the lateral design for wood frame structures with a focus on shear walls and diaphragms. Topics are gonna include lessons learned from natural disasters, load path continuity, um, and we're gonna look at updates to the building code and review shear wall design approaches with some additional time spent on force transfer around openings, uh, shear wall design approaches, and tools to assist the designer. Today's objectives for you guys are really to understand that basic lateral load path through a simple building, recognize the key components of a traditional shear wall and their role, and comprehend the differences between shear wall design approaches. Uh, we also want you to understand the mechanics behind designing force transfer on opening uh, shear walls. So we're going to start with the basics. So this is load path. And it sounds really easy, but uh, it's the basis for any building design where your intent is for the building to stay upright where you built it. The load path is the route the forces take passing through the structure and it's made up of components and connections on the way to the ground. The vertical load path concept is very basic and intuitive. This is gravity loads from snow or building contents and they're going to bear on the sheathing which transfers the loads to the framing members all the way to the foundation. All vertical loads do eventually make it to the ground so that's either by proper design and construction or structural failure. We're going to spend most of today on the lateral load path, but let's take a quick look at some vertical load path mishaps. So these photos show examples of potential vertical load path discontinuities, uh, as in the photo on the upper left, uh, or where supports are not adequately sized to support the load. So you can see in the photo on the right a condition where three studs which support a beam above are supported by a single plated floor truss below. So we went from using three studs above to one two by below. So this really isn't a good sign. The bottom left photo 
shows a buckled eye joist where there was likely a concentrated load. So we're looking down here from a column being supported by the eye joist alone. And so this is resulting in the failure of the eye joist itself. Your lateral hazard is gonna depend on the geographic location of your structure. So if you su superimpose the two maps shown on your screen, uh, one upon the other, you'll notice that you have at least one, if not two significant lateral hazards to evaluate um, most places in the US. Now, wind forces on buildings are applied in a much different way than seismic. However, the building is carrying the force in a very similar, if not the same way. So wind forces are distributed onto the building through both positive and negative pressures as the wind travels around the building surface. And then these pressures are integrated over the entire surface of the building, making up the overall lateral force. The lateral loads on a building from an earthquake are the result of ground acceleration and the mass of the structure. So as the ground accelerates, the foundation moves along with it and the remainder of the building is then left to catch up with the foundation. It's this acceleration of the building that's causing the seismic lateral force on the building. Now, since the lateral force is directly proportional to the mass of the building, lightweight wood frame structures are often better suited to withstand the earthquake forces. This is a photograph taken following the Good Friday earthquake in Alaska. And there's two main points um, that you should consider when you look at this photo. And the first one is a uh, complete load path is really essential. The diaphragms and the shear walls performed uh, really well here, but the attachment to the foundation failed. And the second is wood has a really high strength to weight ratio. So the mass of the structure is typically less than other building materials, and this is yielding a lower seismic design force. In considering lateral design, there are generally four modes of failure that we talk about. So wind and seismic forces on the building can cause the building to lift up or overturn off the foundation. So these are the first two uh, diagrams shown on the top. Then the third failure mode is base shear where instead of lifting or overturning, the structure slides off the foundation. If the structure is unable to slide or shear off its foundation, lateral forces will attempt to rack the walls. And this is the fourth lateral load failure. That's the racking failure you see in the, in the bottom right. These racking forces can be resisted with proper bracing using wood structural panels. When we dissect a typical wall, we'll find a two by four or two by six stud spaced at 16 inches or maybe 24 inches on center with a bottom and top plate. And this frame on its own has very little in-plane stiffness. So for the stiffness, the wall is depending on the sheathing material for its lateral resistance. When the walls are built stiff enough to reduce the racking potential, the other failure modes come into play. The hold down devices are used to resist those overturning forces and the anchor bolts or sill bolts are used to resist the uplift and base shear forces. While there are four general modes of failure, we also need to recognize that there is a progression to failure. So improper detailing for one mode can result in failure before the other modes become engaged. This is a picture of an uplift failure from an F3 tornado in 2003 the uplift loads resulted in a roof failure. So in this case, we're asking, what was that connection for the rafters to that top plate? In many parts of the country, toenails were a pretty common detail prior to 2003, and uh, they might still be used in some places today. However, toenails are really uh, not great for resisting uplift, and in many areas of the country, they've started to move away from that toenailed connection. The 3D connector became a really cost-effective way to resist lateral and uplift loads. By loading the nails laterally, perpendicular to the nail shank, rather than at an angle where the toenail connections provided little resistance in, in nail withdrawal, um, we're really achieving a higher consistent uplift capacity. 
Now, as we progress down the wall, the next area of concern is transferring that uplift force from the walls above past the floor cavity to the walls below and ultimately to the foundation. There are several ways to accomplish this using wood structural panels. Um, if you'd like to take a closer look at some of this detailing, I'd recommend you check out the lateral load path webinar on APA's website. Um, I'm not gonna go too in depth on this today. Now, similar to the Good Friday example, you can see here the roof diaphragm performed really well and the connection from the roof to the walls withstood the lateral loads. The weak link for this house was that connection to the foundation again. So this house was simply blown off the foundation. Now, just like most things in life, almost doesn't really count. So the lateral load path needs to get all the way into the foundation. It needs to be continuous all the way down into that foundation for us to be successful. While very rare overturning or uplift can also be a concern, um, obviously in these photos, multiple things failed. Because high wind events or earthquakes are rare, a lot of times it's difficult to grasp their possible damaging effects on a structure. Ensuring that homes can withstand lateral loads is critical to the safety of the building and its occupants in the event of high winds or an earthquake. Now, without sufficient bracing, a wall can rack or collapse when subject to lateral loads. Now, racking occurs when the rectangular wall changes to a parallelogram shape, where the top and the bottom of the wall are parallel, but the sides are no longer vertical. The damage shown in this picture was a result of a tornado in 2015. The wall sheathing on the front of the home was attached only with tack nailing, so it really wasn't providing that full uh, in plain deer capacity. Some of the images in the previous slides are documented in assessment reports conducted by APA field staff, and they can be found on our webpage. Uh, that's apawood.org. And the details in our building for high wind resistance guide contribute to improved overall performance in the structural shell. Uh, they specifically focus on good connection details to tie together the exterior walls, roofs, and floors. Um, but I will say that some of these design recommendations exceed the minimum code requirements and typical APA recommendations. Now, since the publication of these guidelines in 2011, they've been incorporated into some local building codes, such as the Georgia Disaster Resilient Building Code. So I check with your local jurisdiction. The lateral or horizontal path, again, shows the transfer forces uh, from where they're applied on the building to the ground. In a simple building, the forces begin at the wall in one direction and then transfer to the roof or floor diaphragms via connections. The roof or floor diaphragm is then going to transfer the force to the perpendicular walls at each end or interior walls of the structure. These walls become the shear walls and carry the load into the foundation, thereby completing our load path. The engineer is going to analyze the same building in the opposite direction since wind and earthquakes can act uh, in either direction. Now, the first step in shear wall design starts with determining the loads that need to be resisted. Chapter 16 of the IBC governs the structural design of building and structures. Section 1609 is specifically uh, details the wind load requirements to be in accordance with Chapter 16 to, to 20 of ASCE 7. And then section 1613 in the IBC is going to detail the earthquake loads be in accordance with chapter 11 through 15, chapter 17, and chapter 18 of ASCE 7. Chapter 23 of the IBC provides minimum requirements for the design of buildings and structures that use wood and wood-based products. And section 2305 requires structures using wood frame shear walls or wood frame diaphragms to resist wind, seismic, or other lateral loads to be designed and constructed in accordance with uh, the American Wood Council's special design provisions for wind and seismic. Um, and that's also known as SPIDWIS. I'm going to refer to it as SPIDWIS throughout this presentation. SPIDWIS is available as a free view-only PDF on the American Wood Council's webpage shown here. 
Now, by definition, under Section 202 of the IBC or IRC, wood structural panels are gonna include plywood and oriented strand board or OSB. So going forward, when we use the term wood structural panels, it's intended to include both plywood and OSB products. What about CLT? So APA represents a number of mass timber manufacturers. This is a really hot topic right now as jurisdictions across the country start adopting the tall mass timber provisions. The 2021 SPIDWIS now provides guidance on CLT diaphragm and shear wall design. Uh, AWC or the American Wood Council and Woodworks both have a number of educational resources to help you navigate designing with this new material. Now, as a special note, CLT is gonna use a different response modification coefficient than the 6.5 that's typically used for light frame wood shear walls. And this is because, because the behavior during a wind or seismic event is really not the same as uh, our more traditional shear walls. Today, we're gonna to focus on light frame construction though, not mass timber. Now, when a major wind or seismic event happens, uh, APA often goes out and will survey the damage. In 2017, APA documented this down in Texas where the wind speed was only estimated at about 100 to 110 miles per hour, but the design's wind speed was 115 miles per hour. So after documenting the damage, APA and two universities did some testing and a summary is available in a product advisory on the APA website. Now I've blown up a chart uh, from this document depicting the percentage of published capacities that each round of testing achieved. So this is 100% of the published value. The product advisory also includes a discussion on ductility, uh, but it's important to understand that as new materials hit the market, what kind of performance indicators we need to be looking at before assuming they're equal. So the 2021 SPIDWIS now directly references the ASTM D7989 standard, and that was used for this testing. And uh, that applies whenever looking at an alternative sheathing product. Now, ideally, we're getting better at predicting these performance deficiencies before something like this happens, but every time there's a failure, it's, it's a learning experience. For wood structural panels, the shear value in SPIDWIS are a function of fastener size and spacing, panel thickness, and the specific gravity of the framing material. SPIDWIS tables 4.2a, b, and c provide nominal unit shear capacities for wood frame diaphragms for blocked wood structural panels, uh, blocked wood structural panels with multiple rows of fasteners, so that's our high load diaphragms, and unblocked wood structural panel diaphragms, respectively. SPIDWIS table 4.3a is gonna provide the nominal unit shear capacities for our wood frame shear walls using wood-based panels. <clears throat> the orientation of the panels doesn't affect the lateral or shear capacity provided the edges are all supported or blocked. However, the layup of veneers or strands typically give wood structural panels greater strength in the long direction of the board. And for this reason, wood structural panels should be installed with their strength direction running perpendicular to the supports. And that's to achieve that span rating that's listed on the APA trademark stamp for gravity design. But I'm gonna re-emphasize that the lateral capacity is not dictated by the span rating or the panel orientation. However, wood diaphragm tables 4.2 A, B, and C um, have a detail six and detail six different cases for different load applications and panel layouts. And that needs to get considered when you're selecting your nominal unit shear capacities. So we're gonna take a look at that, uh, those six cases. Before you use any of the cases shown on the bottom row, I'm gonna again reiterate, panels need to be installed perpendicular to supports to achieve the span rating specified on the stamp. Um, otherwise, you need to do some extra analysis to make sure you're meeting your gravity design limitations. So ideally, we're, we're living in this row up here. 
Now in the 2012 IBC, the shear wall diaphragm tables with common nail fasteners were removed from chapter 23. So currently the diaphragm tables only contain values utilizing staples. The SPIDWIS lists the nominal values for diaphragms using the common nail fasteners. The new 2021 SPIDWIS only shows nominal shear values and differentiates between wind or seismic and ASD or LRFD using factors instead of separate areas of the table the way they did before. So this shift didn't affect most of the ASD values, but if you're using LRFD values, your capacities have now dropped about 12 to 13%. Wood diaphragms are commonly idealized as flexible. Um, now the discussion of flexible versus rigid has been moved to section 4.1.7 in the 2021 SPIDWIS, and it now directly refers to ASC 7 for per parameters on what can be idealized as flexible. Um, just like before, ASC 7 gives both calculated and prescriptive paths for this assumption. Diaphragms can be idealized as flexible or idealized as rigid, analyzed as semi-rigid, or designed using the envelope approach. A diaphragm is considered flexible when the midpoint displacement under lateral load exceeds twice the average displacement of the end supports. A diaphragm is considered rigid when its midpoint displacement under lateral load is less than twice the average displacement at its ends. A uh, semi-rigid diaphragm um, distributes the loads to the shear walls based on relative stiffness of the shear wall and diaphragm. And the envelope approach, which has been used by many designers of large wood buildings in the past, is going to assign the larger lo load of the flexible or rigid assumption to each element um, individually. Now, I'd like you to be aware that there are special considerations that fall kind of outside our flexible and rigid requirement. So SPIDWIS section 4.2.6 has been updated for wood frame diaphragms and open front structures to be more consistent with ASC 7 by eliminating the maximum story drift at each edge to not exceed the ASC 7 allowable story drift when subject to seismic design forces and increase the the building configuration shown. The cantilever diaphragm length, that's the L prime that you see on the on your screen, is not allowed to exceed 35 feet. And for open front structures that are also torsionally irregular, the L prime, the length versus width ratio, um, is not allowed to exceed 0.67 to 1 for structures over one story in height and 1 to 1 for structures one story in height. Um, and this is with that torsional irregularity. Because of our rigid versus flexible determination, deflection is a really important component in determining your force distribution. So you can calculate the deflection of the diaphragm and shear walls using equation 23-1 and 23-2 found in section 2305.2 and 2305.3 in the 2021 IBC. Now, additionally, uh, you might want to take a look at APA's design construction guide, uh, diaphragms and shear walls. Um, it's a really good reference source. Equation one from table 4.2.3 of the 2021 SPIDWIS can also be used to calculate the diaphragm deflection. This equation accounts for the actual stiffness characteristics of the diaphragm and combines both shear and nail slip into one term. So that's that GA term and provides direct calculation for unblocked diaphragms. The 2021 SPIDWIS also introduced two additional equations for the deflection of cantilevered diaphragms. This is a good example of high, a high load diaphragm. Um, and the idea of panelized wood roof construction is really to pre-assemble large sections on the ground. Um, these pre-framed pre panels are fabricated by using production line techniques to fasten sections of APA panels to lumber stiffeners. And then this assembly can be done either at the site or in a shop off-site. 
these free frame sections are then lifted into position and fastened into place. And there are a number of different ways to create uh, the roof system. In this example, the panels are nailed to two by four stiffeners at 24 inches on center and wood trusses are used for, uh, for the purlins. Trusses are a really good option when you're looking at spans of 40 feet or more. Now in this example, we can also see the use of cantilevered glue lamb beams being used as the main girders. There's almost no limit on the size of the facility that you can cover with a wood structural panel roof. So this is a GE warehouse near Ontario. Um, in this project, we're looking at a roof that's over a million square feet covered in wood. High load block diaphragms uh, need to be constructed in accordance with the 2021 SPIDWIS. So these diaphragms typically have multiple rows of nails and they're located at least three eighths of an inch from all the panel edges with a maximum nail spacing at panel edges of six inches on center and six inches on center in the field when a support spacing greater than 32 inches on center is specified. The lines of fasteners uh, also need to be equally spaced within each line and should be staggered where the spacing is less than three inches on center. So testing's shown that the capacities are really limited by the two inch thick lumber splitting. So three inch deep members or three by members is the minimum allowed for areas where the tight, nail, tight diaphragm nailing is specified. As we mentioned earlier, the layup of veneers or strands give wood structural panels greater strength in the long direction of the board. And so for this reason, wood structural panels uh, should be installed with their strength direction running perpendicular to the supports. And that's again to achieve that span rating that's listed in the APA trademark for out of plane bending. Um, but again, the nominal unit shear capacities for the wood based panels uh, used in the shear wall design table in 4.3a are not dependent at all on panel orientation. So they can be installed vertically or horizontally provided the blocking is installed behind the panel edges to achieve that required shear capacity. SPIDWIS provides designers with three acceptable methods for designing wood shear walls to resist lateral forces. Individual full height wall segments, this is the traditional design approach. Perforated shear walls, which is an empirical design method based on the percentage of full height wall segments adjacent to openings. And then finally, force transfer shear walls. And I'm gonna to refer to those in this presentation as force transfer on opening or FTAO walls. And that allows the utilization of the full wall geometry, including that sheathed area above and below the openings. For both segmented and perforated shear wall designs, the wall width is defined as the width of the full height sheathing adjacent to openings. The height to width ratio is not allowed to exceed two to one uh, or three and a half to one ratio if you apply some adjustments. Now, whereas the force transfer approach is the same wall width, but the height here is defined as the height of the sheathing adjacent to the openings. So by using the height of the sheathing adjacent to the openings, we can get much narrower piers uh, per code. As noted on the previous slide, the aspect ratio for all approaches needs to be between two to one or three and a half to one with adjustments. Now, when the aspect ratio is greater than two to one, but less than three and a half to one, an aspect ratio factor must be applied to the nominal shear capacity of the shear wall. The aspect ratio factor can be calculated with the equation shown. So that's that 1.25 minus 0.125 times the height of the pier divided by the base width of the pier. So that height of the pier is either the full height or the height adjacent to opening if you're doing an FTAO wall. It should also be noted that the aspect ratio factor previously applied only to seismic design, but now applies to all design. And this was new in the 2015 SPIDWIS. 
with this new adjustment factor, one item that you need to be aware of is its restriction of identical wall deflections for multiple shear walls in a line. And this is mentioned in SPIDWIS section 4.3. There is an exception to this requirement if you apply the old reduction factor of two times the pier width divided by the height. Um, if you'd like more information on this, it can be found in the SPIDWIS section shown at the top of your screen. Note that the provisions of section 4.3.3.2 and sections 4.3.5.5.1 5 aren't going to apply to perforated shear wall segments. Another clarification that's useful to note is uh, with the perforated approach. So the 2015 SPIDWIS clarified that you're going to apply that adjustment factor only to the individual wall segments. So for example, say uh, wall pier B4 and B1 have a three and a half to one aspect ratio where piers B2 and B3 don't. So you would apply the factor to the length of pier B1 and B4, but you wouldn't apply the factor to piers B2 and B3. Now it's less of a penalty than it had been in the past, but uh, note that this is the historical adjustment factor of 2B over H, not the new adjustment factor that you have to use for this. So we're gonna take a little bit of a closer look at the three different design approaches for shear walls, starting with that traditional segmented shear wall. Now, as we mentioned before in the comparison, only full height segments count towards our lateral resistance. The aspect ratios are the height width ratios and we're using the full height wall sections. Typically with a segmented approach, we also have to place a hold down at each side of every full height wall pier in order to resist our tension and compression or our overturning forces. In general, the segmented approach is very simplistic and really easy to analyze. So assuming similar aspect ratios, the designer is gonna take the total shear and divide this by the sum of the pier segment lengths to get the unit shear per lineal foot across each segment along the same line. Now sufficient anchor bolts or sill bolts need to get installed at the base of each pier segment to resist that base shear load. Hold down forces are then gonna be calculated for each segment and are simply found by multiplying that base shear by the segment height. The tabulated allowable unit shear would be adjusted by a factor. So in this case, we're gonna use 2.8 for seismic ASD design. And the aspect ratio factor for the walls with aspect ratios between two to one and three and a half to one. Now observe, I've listed both aspect ratio factors here. Using the 1.25 minus 0.125 H over B requires that the deflection for each segment be equal. Um, however, SPIDWIS does still allow us to ignore this if you use that historic adjustment factor of 2B over H. So you can take a little bit of a bigger hit, but you don't have to um, make sure all the deflections for each segment are equal. Now let's take a look at an example shear wall design using the segmented approach. So we're going to consider this typical wall with three openings, so two three foot six inch and two four-foot shoe segments, resisting a load of 3,750 pounds. The height of the openings uh, don't come into play for the segmented approach at all for ignoring any sheathing above or below the openings. Note that the aspect ratio of the three-foot six-inch walls is 2.9 to 1, so that's right in our range between 2 to 1 and the 3.5 to 1. So we need to apply an aspect ratio factor. I've listed both equations here, but as discussed, there's a price associated with the, with the first equation. So our first step is to calculate the unit shear that needs to be uh, restrained by the four segments. So we have two three foot six inch segments and two four foot segments. So we're, that's totaling uh, 15 feet. We're gonna calculate the unit shear at 250 pounds per foot 
We're then going to calculate the required hold down force at each end of each panel at 2,000 pounds by multiplying that unit shear by the wall height. We can then go to SpidWiz table 4.3a and select a panel thickness and nailing pattern that exceeds the required unit shear. So in this case, we need a 15 30 second category sheathing panel with eight penny nails at four inches on center uh, for the three foot six inch segments and six inches on center for the four foot segments. Uh, please note that we're going to use the 2B over H adjustment factor so that our deflection check is not required. Now let's look at perforated shear wall designs. So the openings in a perforated shear wall are accounted for by an empirical adjustment factor. Hold downs are only at the ends of the wall as opposed to the ends of each full height segment. So we get fewer hold downs overall. Um, uplift connections are also needed on all the full height wall segments. So there are some limitations of note for perforated shear walls in SpidWiz. This is section 4.3.2.3, um, and that's such as a maximum 20 foot wall height um, and a uniform top of wall elevation. So take a look at those limitations before, before you try to design a perforated shear wall. So we're gonna revisit the same example and design the shear wall using the perforated approach. To calculate the unit shear in the wall, we're gonna divide that total shear of 3,750 pounds by the sum of the full height wall segments. So note that the segments with aspect ratios greater than two to one are adjusted by multiplying these segment lengths by 2B over H. So, which is, we're calculating at 0.875 for those three foot six inch walls. This leads to a unit shear in the wall segments of 268 pounds per foot. We're then gonna calculate the percent of full height sheath wall by dividing the sum of the perforated shear wall lengths by the total length of the wall. Now step three is new to the 2021 SpidWiz. Here we're calculating the total opening area and dividing it by the total wall area. So this changed in the 2021 SpidWiz. We need this to determine the shear capacity factor, C sub O, by using it, by using our percent of full height sheathing and interpolating. So based on our uh, wall area opening ratio of 20%, we get an adjusted factor of 0.88. This table changed again in the 2021 SpidWiz, and this was to better align with the new and improved C sub O equation. Now, depending on your geometry, this could increase your C sub O factor. So making this a, a great design option for some, some wall geometries. Now from table 4.3a for that 15 30 second category sheathing uh, with eight penny nails at four inches on center, we're gonna get a nominal unit shear of 1,065 pounds per foot. We're then gonna divide that uh, by a factor of 2.8 for seismic ASD design, and then multiply our C sub O factor of 0.88. This is gonna give us an allowable shear of 335 pounds per foot, which uh, well exceeds our required 268 pounds per foot. In accordance with SpidWiz, we calculate our hold down forces at the ends of the wall by multiplying our total shear times the wall height divided by our C sub O factor, and then multiplying by the adjusted sum of the full height wall segments. We're gonna calculate this force out to be 2,435 pounds. SpidWiz equation 4.3-9 requires in-plane shear anchorage to be the maximum induced unit shear force, or Vmax, that's calculated by dividing the total shear by that same 14 feet times the C sub O factor. And we calculate uh, 304 pounds per foot. The uplift anchorage is gonna equal that unit shear force V max, which we just calculated. Um, and this anchorage is only required at those full height segments. 
the deflection can then be determined based on the deflection on any segment of the of the wall divided by the adjustment factor c sub o so now that we've reviewed both segmented and perforated approach we're going to take a look at force transfer on openings approach uh, which provides a lot of benefits in contrast to the segmented and perforated approaches um, but we're going to start with a brief overview of APA's FTAO research. So in 2009, a joint research project was conducted by APA, the University of British Columbia, and the USDA Forest Products Lab in order to examine the internal forces generated in wood structural panel wood framed shear walls during a lateral event. The test results in conjunction with analytical computer-based models from the University of British Columbia were used to develop an enhanced FTAO design methodology and evaluate the accuracy of the calculated forces in the wall using historic FTAO methods. Through APA's study of design offices, it was found that there were four techniques that were most commonly used to predict force transfer around openings. The first is the drag strut analogy, then we have the cantilever beam analogy, and then we have the Diekman technique. And then the Thompson technique or Thompson method is really very similar to the Diekman method. So if we take a look at a simple wall example and compare the results from these three different techniques, and consider a wall with a 2,000 pound shear force at the top of the wall. Uh, running through each of these three analysis methods produces a pretty wide variety of results, and this is really what prompted the APA research test plan. When looking at the four rational analysis methods, APA recognized that the drag struck technique was pretty consistently unconservative, the cantilever beam technique was ultra conservative and the Diekman and Thompson methods both provided reasonable agreement with the measured strap forces. Moving forward with these results, the hope was to provide better guidance for engineers by validating the techniques currently in use and developing new tools to facilitate FTAO shear wall design. If you'd like more information, please visit our website. You can find the test report there by searching force transfer or uh, form M. 410, as well as a full hour long FTAO webinar on the webinar page. So let's take a look at the example problem that we have previously analyzed using the segmented and perforated shear wall approaches. And the first thing you might notice here is that this wall is going to ignore the section to the left of the door opening. And this is because our FTAO approach requires a wood structural panel above and below the opening. And as there's no panel below a door opening, uh, the FTAO panel needs to be analyzed adjacent to the door opening. The first step is really pretty straightforward. So by summing the moment around a hold down, it's easy to calculate the force of the opposite hold down. And this gets us uh, 1,538 pounds uh, for our hold down force. The next step is to calculate the unit shear above and below the opening. These shear forces are equal and calculated by dividing the hold down force by the sum of the distance above and below the largest opening. And that's gonna get us 288 pounds per foot. We're then gonna calculate the boundary force above and below each opening. This force is equal to the unit shear times the length of the opening. So in this example, this calculates out to be 1,731 pounds for opening one and 577 pounds for opening two. Once we have the boundary forces, we can calculate our corner forces. So this is equal to the boundary force of the opening times the length of the panel next to the corner and then divided by the length of the sum of the panel lengths on each side of the opening. And these corner forces are what we're using as our strap forces. Our next step is to calculate the tributary length of the openings, which is gonna serve as our basis for calculating the shear that's getting applied to each pier. 
These lengths are found by multiplying the length of the pier adjacent to the opening times the length of the opening and then dividing by the sum of the length of the piers on each side of the opening. The calculated pier lengths for T1 through T4 are shown here. Now, as I mentioned, the tributary length is used to calculate the shear in the full height wall piers. The unit base shear in each pier is found by dividing the total shear, V, divided by the total length of the wall. This is then multiplied by the length of the pier plus the tributary length from the opening and then divided by the length of the pier. This is straightforward when there are only openings on one side of a pier, but note that when there is an, a pier between two openings uh, as the V2 pier here, you need to add in the tributary length of each opening. So for this example, the shear in the piers are calculated at 337 pounds, 388 pounds, and 244 pounds per foot as we move from left to right. We can now calculate the resistance to corner forces, which is the shear beside the opening times the length of the pier. Now this resistance can be used to find the difference of the corner force and resistance, which is simply the resistance to the corner force minus the corner force forces found in step four. Note that between the opening, the strap force, F2 and F3 uh, from each opening is subtracted. This resistance to corner forces uh, is gonna get used to calculate the unit shear in the corner panels. The unit shear in the corner zones are calculated by dividing the difference of the corner forces and the resistance by the length of the pier. So in this example, we calculated the corner force zone shear at 120, 95, and 167 pounds per foot. Now, once all the segment shears are calculated, you can check the design by summing the shears vertically along each line. So the first and last should equal the hold down force and the rest should all equal zero. Now that, <clears throat> now that we've calculated the corner forces in the panels, we can refer to SPIDWIS table 4.3a. And we're gonna look at that 15 30 second category panel with the eight penny nails at four inches on center and we can calculate our allowable at 1,065 pounds per foot divided by that 2.8 for seismic ASD, which gets us a capacity of 380 pounds per foot. You can see the maximum shear demand of these piers uh, in pounds per foot. We've got 337, 388, and 244 as we move across. So that middle pier is gonna be 2% overstressed with that four inch on center nailing because um, that capacity was calculated out at 380 pounds per foot. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a judgment call. Many designers are gonna consider that acceptable. So if we review our results and compare the three methods, you'll notice that we use the same sheathing but the nailing was slightly tighter for the perforated or FTAO compared to the segmented approach. But both the perforated and FTAO approach are gonna have fewer hold downs, which can often be challenging to install. The FTAO approach does have additional strapping compared to the perforated approach, but the hold downs are smaller. And then as stated at the beginning, generally the driving force for FTAO is cases where you don't have a wall long enough to meet your height to width ratio, um, whether that's two to one or the three and a half to one with those adjustments. And so in those instances, you're really forced into using FTAO. Testing data was also used to analyze the overall deflection of the FTAO wall systems, uh, which verified the sheathing below the opening aided in resisting the overall deflection of the wall. The wall deflection assumption is that the total deflection of the FTAO shear wall is equivalent to the averages of the deflection of each wall pier in both the positive and negative directions. The wall pier heights also vary depending on the deflection directions and the amount of sheathing below the opening. So for example, 
the positive deflection of wall pier one is determined using the height measured from the bottom of the opening to the top of the wall. And that's due to that resistance of the wall sheathing below the opening. Whereas in the negative deflection direction of wall pier one, that deflection is determined using the full height of the wall. The results of APA's testing were used to develop a couple design resources to facilitate FTAO shear wall design. All of these design resources are located for download on APA's website at apawood.org slash FTAO. Um, I will note when downloading these resources from APA's website, you do need to register and create an account before accessing the tools. The two resources I'm gonna highlight here today are APA's technical notes, the design for force transfer on openings and APA's force transfer on openings calculator. Both were updated in January 2022 and are available for download on the webpage. The technical note, also known as Form T555, presents a rational analysis for applying FTAO to walls with asymmetric piers and multiple openings. And then as a companion to the technical note, APA developed an Excel-based force transfer on openings calculator. So the calculator is a tool for engineers to use for analyzing shear walls with up to three openings and is based on the design methodology developed by Diekman. I'm gonna walk through uh, a couple features of the tool real quickly before we finish up for the day. So the first tab on the spreadsheet is for instructions and definitions, and this tab provides definitions of all the variables and inputs that need uh, to get input for the shear wall and deflection calculations. The design example tab of the spreadsheet is gonna show how to design the example in the FTAO tech note um, using the calculator. And the calculator is divided into three separate worksheets. So one for shear walls with one, two, and three openings. The calculator groups the results in the design summary section, which is gonna include that maximum shear force, the required horizontal strap force, and that maximum hold down force. It also has a shear wall deflection section. Um, now, after entering the project specific parameters, the spreadsheet will calculate the overall wall deflection and this deflection is calculated by determining the average of the positive and negative deflection values for each pier using that four-term deflection equation from the IBC. The calculator is not going to tell you if the sheathing and nailing parameters that you enter for the deflection calculations meet the required sheathing capacity that you calculated above. So this is just a warning. The calculator also will show the results uh, for a three-term deflection equation, and that's that equa three-term equation from SpidWiz. And then the calculator's final design output includes the FTAO shear wall analysis with the full design equation shown, a summary of the final design requirements, and the total calculated deflection. The analysis results fit on it on three pages and you can print them directly from Excel or save them as a PDF file. Our website's really one of the most powerful tools. So all of the resources I mentioned today can be downloaded from the website with uh, a free registration. The link shown here is gonna take you directly to our FTAO webpage if you would like to take a look at that calculator or tech note. That's gonna conclude. I'm gonna turn the mic back over to Karen and turn on the video. Thank you, Alita. Excellent um, webinar and great engagement by our attendees. Thank you all. Um, we have a few minutes that we're able to get into some Q&A. And before we do that, though, I do want to point out that our QR code has reappeared on the screen. So if you didn't get a chance to um, click onto that earlier to link to our survey, please take a moment to do that now because your feedback is very important to us. It helps us improve webinars as we move forward and, and that's important to us to serve all of you. So now I have a moment here. Let me see questions for Alita. Um, 
the easy one for you to begin with, I think. What's the benefit of orienting wall panels horizontally instead of vertically? I think I mentioned this earlier. There's really no difference in the in-plane shear capacity, um, but there is a difference in that out-of-plane capacity. So just like with floor sheathing over joists, you're going to get more capacity by spanning that sheathing strength axis perpendicular to the studs. Um, but the downside of orienting the panels horizontally is really that additional blocking that you're going to put in. So you get a benefit on the out of plane capacity side, but you're going to add extra blocking likely in your wall. Yeah, so ease of construction kind of lends it back to more the vertical installation more often um, is the case. Thank you. So another one. If I fully sheath my wall, do I need to consider the whole wall as a perforated shear wall? You're not required to consider the whole wall line, um, but there might be some advantages uh, in really simplifies, simplifying your hardware layout um, if you do that. So you might have to weigh the pros and cons of that on a kind of case by case basis. Yeah, and I think that takes us back to the examples you were just going through. And one of the questions came in of, you know, why did you include beyond the doorway? So, um, I, again, I was answering questions while you were talking. I don't know if that was addressed in what you were sharing, Alita, but um, maybe take a moment there and explain that as well as far as whether you include beyond the door or not in the perforated. Yeah, well, obviously, if you consider beyond the door, it's going to affect where your hold downs are located. Um, you do get a little bit uh, more wall area, but when you're calculating that CSIP O factor, depending on the sizes of your door openings and the sizes of your window openings, um, it might affect your overall capacity um, that you're getting based on that CSIP O factor. So um, again, it really depends on your geometry, uh, whether you're really getting an advantage. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's why today we talked through the three different approaches. So you know that you have lots of options, lots of tools in your tool belt. Um, one more question. How do I incorporate vertical loads from the walls above in your FTAO calculator? I think the short answer is, uh, is you don't. So the calculator um, doesn't include vertical loads uh, and whether that's, you know, dead load, live load, snow load or you're talking about wind uplift and seismic uplift from the wall above um, that kind of needs to be done um, after you use the calculator. Uh, the APA calculator definitely won't do that for you. Yeah, thanks Alita and thanks again for a great session today. If you had a question that we didn't get to and I know Usually questions just start snowballing in um, as I'm wrapping up with the speaker. So uh, we will be getting those out to our field services staff and someone will be getting back to you as soon as we can. So um, before we conclude, I just wanted to touch on a few quick reminders. Please make sure that you're signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you'll be notified of future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. And to receive it, all you need to do from our homepage is to click on sign in in the upper right hand corner of the page. In the drop down menu, select register, and then you'll need to let us know what you'd like to receive. In this case, it would be the APA update newsletter. And APA has field staff located throughout the country. These talented people like Alita are available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials. Their individual contact information can be found on our website at apawood.org. Please reach out and take advantage of this free resource. And don't forget to download the AIA or ICC Certificate of Completion. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great day.